All right, everyone, thank you again so much for joining us this evening for our um, Women's History Month presentation um, at the Dauphin County Library System. Uh, my name is Emily Anderson, and I am the Assistant Adult Programming and Outreach Coordinator here for the Dauphin County Library System. And I am very happy to introduce Melinda Triller Doran this evening, um, who will be our presenter for tonight's presentation. The Triller Doran is a special collections librarian um, from Dickinson College, um, who graduated from the University of Pittsburgh in 2000. 2006 with her master's in library and information science. Um, without further ado, thank you so much, Melinda, uh, for being here with us this evening. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Emily, um, and thank you to the Dauphin County Lot Public Library System for inviting me to be with you all tonight. And <clears throat> thank you very much, all of you, for, for joining us. Uh, I was very honored and excited to be invited to talk about Esther Popel Shaw. Just a little bit about me. Um, I grew up in central Pennsylvania, uh, most of that time in Franklin County and graduated from Wilson College in Chambersburg, which is where I fell in love with archives. I was actually an English major, but I took a lot of history classes for the pure fun of it. And um, the first time a professor brought me into the college archives, I was just amazed. I didn't know such a place existed. And what captured my attention the most was that this was a place that had materials that told the, the everyday lives of, of people, um, especially women. And so I, after graduation, I worked in other aspects of college administration for a while, but I always felt this tug to the archives and I missed my work in history. So um, I made the leap and went back to graduate school and got um, a master's degree in public history through Shippensburg University, where I did a couple of internships that were also archives related, which just clinched the deal for me that archives were where I wanted to be. So I then did go to um, the University of Pittsburgh, as Emily mentioned, for my um, Master of Library Science degree, and then came here to Dickinson College, which was my first professional and my only professional um, library experience. So I have been here at Dickinson College since 2006. Um, so I am going to talk about Esther Popel Shaw by sharing with you the documents that we have here in the Dickinson College archives and some materials that I've been able to find through various databases or digital archives projects um, to share the story of Esther Popel Shaw in terms of, of what I know at this point. Um, and certainly look forward to your questions or any information that you may have um, that you would be able to share. So I'm going to screen share my PowerPoint. All right. So hopefully, Emily, can you confirm that the PowerPoint is showing with the title Esther Popel Shaw and an image of Esther Popel? Yes, everything's looking good to me. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much. So uh, I first learned about Esther Popel Shaw when I joined the Dickinson College Archives and Special Collections about 15 years ago. The college archivist was giving me an overview of landmarks in the college's history. And he told me that Ms. Popel Shaw was the first African-American woman known to have graduated from Dickinson a member of the class of 1919, so just a little over 100 years ago. And he told me also that she was a Harlem Renaissance poet, which was interesting to me as an English major. He showed me her volume of poems uh, called A Forest Pool, which was published in 1934. And if my slides are forwarding correctly, here you can see photographs of the copy of a, a forest pool that we have here in Special Collections, which uh, Esther Popel inscribed to the college's Dean of Women, Josephine Meredith. So over here on the right is the inscription um, inside the booklet that she donated to the college. And when I first saw this booklet, I, I read A Forest Pool and 
the poetry struck a chord with me and I became very interested to learn more about Esther Popol Shaw. So here you can see the table of contents with the titles of all of the poems in this anthology and then the title poem also, A Forest Pool. Esther Popol enrolled at Dickinson as a freshman in September of 1916 as a member of the class of 1919. And this is a scan of the page in the matriculation register where a college administrator entered her full name. And I hope you can see my cursor when I screen share. I'm not sure if that shows up. Yes, we can see your cursor. You can see that? Okay, yes. great. Um, so here her full name is written as Esther Alvilda Bowers Popol. And I think this might be a misspelling because I think this second L might be an error. She chose the Latin scientific course of study, which would have allowed her to study modern languages in place of classical Greek. And from her transcript, we know that she studied French, German, Spanish, and Latin while at the college. So a lot of languages. And then her high school is listed here as Harrisburg Central High School. This is the other side of the two page spread of that matriculation register. And the second to last entry is the continuation of Esther Popol's entry. We see that she was born on July 16th, 1896 in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania to parents Joseph Gibbs Popol and Helen King Anderson. And her home address at the time is listed as 131 Linden Street. There was only one other African-American student at Dickinson when Esther Popol enrolled. That was fellow freshman William Jefferson from Steelton, whose junior yearbook photo is pictured here. And the brief biographical profile here on the left was most likely written by another student who would have been a member of the yearbook staff. So for each student, they listed where they were from, if they had a nickname, a quote that may or may not have been chosen by that student that might have been chosen by the yearbook staff. And then the yearbook staff wrote a short bio or profile of that student. There were 148 freshmen in Esther Popol's class and a total of 384 students at the college in the fall of 1915. Today we have about 2,300 students and a freshman class is usually somewhere around 550 to 650. This panoramic photo, which I scanned, it was so large, I had to scan it and split it in two so you could see the whole thing. Um, this was taken on our academic quad at some point in Esther Popol's first year at Dickinson. And based on the number of people in the photo, I believe it shows probably just the freshman class and the faculty. And Ms. Popol is shown in the front row here with the gold circle. And then this is a closer view. So here is Esther Popol in that panorama. We've had these panoramas in oversized drawers for years, but we just finally, over the course of the pandemic, pulled them out to officially catalog them. And so when I saw the dates written by the photographer at the bottom of them, the first thing I did was look for Esther Popol because um, I knew that she would have been enrolled at that point in time. So I was very excited to see her included in this photograph. Here is another panoramic photo that was taken during that same photo shoot. This time the students were spread out across campus. So Ms. Popol, if you can see my cursor, is kind of left of center here up against this tree. I will show you an, a closer view. Um, we actually are working with the college arborist to see if that tree still exists. So the landscape has changed quite a bit, but we're curious to know if this Esther Popol tree might still be there. 
And this is a close up. So here, this is Esther Popel looking at the photographer over her books. And then this is William Jefferson standing behind her. So this is Esther Popel's junior yearbook photo and profile. So this is from the same yearbook that I showed you with William Jefferson's photo. The profile states that she comes from Harrisburg each day. And that was because the college did not allow African-American students to live on campus at the time that she and William Jefferson attended. They either needed to commute from home, which is what Esther Popel did on the train from Harrisburg each day, or they needed to board in Carlisle with an African-American family. And that policy changed um, in the fall of 1961 when the first African-American women were allowed to live on campus. So this um, short profile does comment on Esther Popel's academic achievement. They mentioned that her recitations and marks prove her to be a scholar. And when Esther Popel graduated in 1919, she had the honor of being inducted into the Phi Beta Kappa Honor Society, which is the oldest and most prestigious academic honor society in the United States. After graduating, Ms. Popel worked briefly at the Bureau of War Risk Insurance in Washington, D.C. This would have been shortly after the finish of World War I. And then she became a teacher and taught for most of her career at Francis Junior High in Washington, D.C. And she did stay in touch with Dickinson after she graduated. This is an announcement from the May 1925 alumni magazine of her marriage to William Andrew Shaw. And so I imagine she most likely was the one who would have sent the announcement into the college to share with the rest of the, the alumni. And I'm gonna pause a little bit on some of these slides so you have a chance to take in the images or to read the text um, to the extent that you would have time to do so. So you might recall that our copy of her poetry anthology that I started with, A Forest Pool, was inscribed to the Dean of Women. Ms. Popel Shaw also gave inscribed copies of two other pamphlets that she published to various members of the campus community. So on the right here, we have her pamphlet, Personal Adventures and Race Relations, which was a pamphlet published in 1946 based on an address that Ms. Popel Shaw had made before the Women's Club in Lawrenceville, New Jersey. And they thought it was well done and important enough that they wanted to distribute it as a pamphlet. And then on the left here is an anthology called The Franthology, which is poetry by the students at the junior high school where she taught. So this was published in 1949. And again, she inscribed it and sent it to the college. So we now have it in our library. In 1955, Esther Popel Shaw completed and returned the alumni survey that she and all other living alumni received that year. So this is a form letter that was sent out to all the living Dickinsonians in 1955 with her answers to the questions in this kind of peacock colored ink. So um, in her answers, she mentioned that she had visited campus for her 30th class reunion in 1949. And she mentions that she has a heart condition that caused her to have to um, retire. So she lists her present occupation as a retired teacher in 1955, and her heart condition ultimately caused her death. So 
So this is the outside of that um, alumni survey form. And here is a scan of the inside of the form. So she identifies herself as a regular church member. And she lists the organization to which organizations to which she belongs. So she was involved in many organizations, specifically women's organizations. Uh, and she includes here the Washington DC branch of the American Association of University Women, the National Association of College Women, which was an African-American organization that I'll talk about a little bit more later, and a member of the YWCA. The survey asks what magazines she reads regularly. And so she was reading the Saturday Review, the Reporter, American Artist, Today's Art, and Life Magazine. And it's my understanding that um, in her later life, uh, Esther Popelshaw took up painting. Um, so that might explain why she was interested in art magazines. And I'd always love to see an example of her painting, but I have not yet seen that. Um, the college asks what its greatest shortcomings were. And she wrote to me, there were no shortcomings when I was a student. The school seemed to meet all my needs, which always surprised me um, when I reflect back on the fact that she was one of just two African-American students at the college at the time, not able to live on campus. So she was not being treated equally. Uh, she's also asked what the greatest strength of Dickinson was and her answer was, the close ties between students and faculty. And she lists several faculty um, specifically that she identified for their inspiration and mental stimulation. And in 1945, we have this interesting exchange of letters between Esther Popel Shaw and Boyd Lee Spar who was the president of Dickinson's Board of Trustees. And this letter, she actually sent it on National Association of College Women letterhead. So she was writing this letter as an alum of Dickinson, but also as an officer of this African-American women's organization. So in this letter, and I've, it's a two page letter. And so you see the first page of it here on the left. Um, in this letter, Esther Popel explains why she will no longer recommend Dickinson to African-American students. She describes a phone call she got a few years earlier from a Mr. Ellis, whose son was accepted to Dickinson, but was ultimately told his son, quote, would probably be happier if he went to another school since no African-American students had ever been housed in a dormitory on the campus, unquote. And Esther Popel states that as long as this is the case, it will cause her to change my mind about sending my daughter to Dickinson when she becomes old enough to go to college. So this is important um, because this story is going to come up again the story of not allowing African-American students to live on campus and specifically um, the decision is whether or not Esther Popel would send her own daughter to Dickinson. In addition to this letter, Esther Popel sent Boyd Lee Spar a reading list. So this is called Suggested References on Race Relations for the Casual Reader. And it's actually multiple pages. I just scanned the first page here as a sample, uh, but essentially a reading list intended for Boyd Lee Spar to educate him about, educate himself about race, uh, issues of racial equality. So this issue of Dickinson not allowing African-American students to live on campus is important to the story of Esther Popel Shaw's relationship with Dickinson. Ms. Popel Shaw and her husband had a daughter named Patricia Shaw on June 1st, 1926. And Pat Shaw is depicted here in August, 2010. 
This is a clip I took from a video interview that now retired American studies professor Sharon O'Brien did with Pat Shaw in Oslo, Norway in 2010. Professor O'Brien is also very interested in Esther Popelshaw's story, and she actually traced Patricia to Norway and went to visit her to learn more about her mother's story. During this interview, Pat Shaw tells of how she herself was accepted to Dickinson, but was not offered a space in a dormitory. She also was told she would need to board with an African-American family in Carlisle. And so she went to Howard University instead. She ultimately attended, after she graduated from Howard, she attended an international summer school at the University of Oslo, where she was to study Norwegian literature. And Pat Shaw settled and married there in Norway and made a career translating Norwegian folk tales. She had two children, Torkold and Patrick, who I've had the opportunity to meet, and several grandchildren. In spring 2012, a couple years after Professor O'Brien went to Norway to speak with Pat Shaw, Dickinson granted Esther Popel Shaw a posthumous honorary degree. And they invited Patricia Shaw to travel to Carlisle to accept the degree. Her health prevented her from making the trip, but her sons, Torkold on the left here and Patrick on the far right, and Patrick's daughter, Tara, who's here second to the right, they came from Norway to represent the family, along with descendants of the Popel family who live here in the United States. So those are the individuals in the middle of the photo. And I'm sorry, this photo is a little bit grainy. I think it's just a, a quick cell phone snap that somebody shared. During the ceremony, college president Bill Durden apologized to the family for discriminating against Pat and for not allowing her to live on campus. He said, quote, there was an injustice committed by the college leadership decades ago against this family. This action was plain wrong by any humane or moral standard. I wish to acknowledge publicly this wrong and apologize to the family members present on behalf of Dickinson College. And then President Durden invited Tara to consider attending Dickinson herself. I think she was about 16 at the time of this visit. And Tara did enroll. And she enrolled at Dickinson in the fall of 2013. And upon her arrival from Norway, she presented the college with her great grandmother, Esther Popel Shaw's diary, which is pictured here, which was a very generous gift. And the family gave us permission to scan and share the diary online. So if you go to the, Dick the Dickinson College Archives website, you can both look through the original handwritten diary, and you can also read through a transcription of the diary. These are scans of the front cover of the diary and the first page on the inside. And the diary covers Esther Popel's senior year of high school, essentially beginning June 10, 1914, following the completion of her junior year, through April 30th, 1915 of her senior year. Here is the very first page of the diary. Most of it was written in this kind of purpley blue ink, some of it in pencil. And she kept a very lively diary, journaling what she did each day and usually listing everyone she saw and talked to in the course of the day. So. She actually says here, friends I saw today, and then this is her list of friends and neighbors that she saw. She also lists what books she's reading, what she's doing in school, and what she does for fun. And um, she also inserts a lot of German. So she was into languages, even in high school. Um, she signs off on many of her journal entries with German.
oh, I just noticed this and I'll point this out. In the middle of the entry here, it says, finished a copy of Thoughtless Thinks and sent it to my little missus in DC. And I will come back to that and talk with, about that a little bit more. So remember Thoughtless Thinks, I just noticed that. So very interestingly, on March 5th, 1915, and this is one of the entries in pencil towards the end where she was running out of space. And so she's really trying to cram a lot in to each page. Um, so it is challenging to read. She writes, I'm hoping to go to Oberlin College next year, maybe. Wow. Um, so there's no mention at all in this entire diary of Dickinson. So that decision must have been later after the diary ends or she didn't put it in her diary. And really up until 2010, when Professor O'Brien visited Pat Shaw in Norway, and then in spring 2012, when members of the family visited campus, I didn't know much about Esther Popel's life before she came to Dickinson. Um, until we had this diary. So this diary really um, contains a lot of information about her earlier life. And in preparation for the honorary degree event in 2012, a student and I created an exhibit about Esther Popel Shaw for the college archives. So her family members and other members of the Dickinson community could, could enjoy looking at it and learning about Ms. Popel Shaw. And in order to prepare that exhibit, we reached out to historian Caleb Jackson in Harrisburg. And he connected us with a woman in the Harrisburg area named Elizabeth Overton, who when she was very young had known Miss Popel Shaw. So she knew her personally. And Ms. Overton was kind enough to share photographs with us. So these are photographs um, from when um, Esther Popel Shaw was very young. On the left is a picture of a very young <laughs> Esther um, with her older sister, Helen. On the right is a picture of Esther when she's older, a teenager with her brother, Samuel. Here's another picture of Esther Popel as a young woman or teen. And then on the left, Esther with her sister, Helen, again, at an older age. And then I love these photographs. So on the left <laughs> is a picture of Esther with Harrisburg, the Harrisburg girls basketball team called the Philanders. And she mentions this basketball team in her diary. Um, so this is a picture taken during her senior year in the fall of 1915. And this is Esther Popel with a big smile right front and center. And then on the, the right here is a photo of an adult Esther Popel Shaw. Um, she's on the far left. And then this is her mother, Helen, and her sister, Helen, her nephew, Joe, and then this I understand to be a very young Patricia Shaw. So I mentioned thoughtless thinks earlier, and that might not have made much sense because it's an interesting choice of, of words. Um, so Thoughtless Thinks by a Thinkless Thoughter was a self-published poetry anthology that Esther Popel created and sold during her senior year in high school in order to raise money for college. So this is, as far as we know, her first poetry anthology. And we have this copy thanks also to Elizabeth Overton who shared copies of the version she has. She has an original. So the title page is here on the left, dedicated to her mother and her six best friends. And then the table of contents and the years in which she wrote them over here on the right.
This is the inside of that um, anthology. And um, she mentions right here that she's, you know, she's talking about the insistent wail of her pocketbook. Um, so in this little introduction or prologue to the poetry anthology, she explains why she needs to sell um, these poems in order to raise money to go to college. And here uh, um, are a few of the poems that were published inside that anthology. So we don't have an original copy of this booklet here at Dickinson College. Uh, so I'm very grateful to Elizabeth Overton for making it possible for us to read these poems. The Moreland Springern Research Center at Howard University does have a copy of this booklet. And according to their catalog record, inscribed on the title page of their copy is, quote, a first venture to raise money for college expenses exclamation point. It netted $100, signed Esther Popel. So that's interesting um, to know just how much she earned for college through the sale of these poems. Information about Esther Popel Shaw's life is scattered in various locations, and I'm always keeping an eye out for new information which is rewarding as more and more archives digitize their collections. So around 2012, when we were preparing for the honorary degree ceremony and the exhibit that we did along with that, I Googled Esther Popelshaw's name just to see what I might find. And I found two photographs in the digital collections of the New York Public Library. These are photographs of Esther Popelshaw at a birthday party for Harlem Renaissance author Langston Hughes. And this party took place in May, 1925. Um, that's what the, the catalog says, but actually as I'm looking here, somebody wrote it at some point, 1922. So maybe there's a little bit of discrepancy there. Um, this is Esther Popelshaw right here in the middle. And this is Langston Hughes over here on the left. and they're up on a rooftop. Um, so you can see there are other buildings in the skyline across the back. And this is another photo of the same party. And this is Esther Popel in the front having a lot of fun. So this is also from the New York Public Library's digital collections. When I learned about this connection with Langston Hughes, I pulled out his autobiography to see if he mentioned Esther Popelshaw, and he does. In a chapter titled, Poetry is Practical, in which he describes his first poetry prize for the poem, The Weary Blues, and he won the prize through a literary contest in Opportunity, which was the magazine of the National Urban League. He mentions how this poetry prize opened doors for him to other African-American poets in Washington, D.C., where he was at the time, particularly at regular salons hosted by author Georgia Douglas Johnson. So he's mentioning here those salons and the people that he regularly saw at those salons, and one of those people is Esther Popel. In addition to her Forest Pool anthology, which I showed at the beginning of this talk, um, Esther Popelshaw also published her poetry in the magazine Opportunity, where Langston Hughes won the Poetry Prize, and in the magazine The Crisis, which is the magazine of the NAACP. 
And here are two poems by Esther Popol titled Kinship and Credo. And these were published in the January 1925 issue of Opportunity. Perhaps her best known poem, Flag Salute, was published in the crisis twice. Ms. Popelshaw wrote the poem in response to the October 18th, 1933 lynching of George Armwood. The young African-American man was accused of attacking an elderly white woman named Mary Denston in Princess Anne, Maryland. The incident received a large amount of press coverage. The crisis printed Ms. Popelshaw's poem in August 1934, shortly after it was written, and then featured it, as you see here, on the cover of the November 1940 issue. In this powerful poem, Esther Popelshaw juxtaposes the Pledge of Allegiance with a description of a lynching. In addition to publishing poetry, Esther Popelshaw regularly published book reviews in the Journal of Negro History and the Journal of Negro Education. This is her review of Mary Church Terrell's book, A Colored Woman in a White World. The review was published in the Journal of Negro History in January 1941. In addition to being a published poet, Esther Popelshaw was also very involved in acti activism for racial equality. She was a member of Delta Sigma Theta, an African-American sorority that is still active today, which advocated for access to quality education, women's suffrage, and the rights of African-Americans. In the 1930s, Ms. Popelshaw served as chair of the sorority's Vigilance Committee for several years. The committee spearheaded the group's efforts for racial justice, tackling issues such as lynching, education, and employment. There was no chapter of Delta Sigma Theta at Dickinson when Esther Popel was here. There weren't enough African-American students for that, but she was allowed to join retroactively as a college graduate after she moved to the Washington, D.C. area. She was also a charter member of the National Association of College Women, whose mission was to support African-American women's pursuit of higher education. Esther Popelshaw served as secretary on that organization's executive board for 19 years. And that organization, um, that was the letterhead that she used in her letter to Boyd Lee Spar at Dickinson in 1945. Esther Popelshaw is pictured here in this newspaper clip from the Baltimore Afro-American, May 12th, 1934. This is a photograph of women at the National Association of College Women's Convention in Atlanta, Georgia. This is Esther Popel here in the front. And the image is grainy just because it's taken out of a newspaper. This is a closer view, so hopefully you can see her a little bit better. Um, so this is Esther Popel Shaw here in the front row next to Lucy Diggs Slow, 
who was the first Dean of Women of Howard University and served as the first president of this women's organization. Esther Popel Shaw retired from teaching in 1952 due to a heart condition, and she passed away from a stroke on January 28, 1958, at the age of 61. Here is an announcement of her death from the Washington Post, and I realize that they misspell her maiden name in a couple of places here, but national newspapers don't include obituaries or announcements of the deaths of everyone in their area. So I think it's significant that Esther Popel Shaw's death is announced here. Esther Popel Shaw has certainly left a legacy through her poetry and her other writings and her activism. In 2014, Dickinson renamed its Office of Diversity Initiatives as the Esther Popel Shaw Center for Race and Ethnicity. Ms. Popel Shaw's great-granddaughter, Tara Iverson, graduated from Dickinson with majors in English and Italian studies, so also into languages. She also graduated Phi Beta Kappa and received honors in Italian studies. So the family legacy of academic excellence continues. And I hope that we will continue to learn more about Esther Popel Shaw as more and more historical newspapers are being digitized. The Harrisburg Telegraph newspaper is now available on newspapers.com. And you can see an article from that newspaper here on the digital Harrisburg site, which is worth exploring. It includes newspaper clippings about Esther Popel Shaw's earlier life, which is something I don't know much about other than what we know from the diary that the family contributed to us. And I really value those days when I can do a little more research and a little more learning. And I certainly welcome anyone who knows more about Esther Popel Shaw to share what they know. So that is what I had planned um, to share with you today. I'll stop my screen share. And I'm just gonna take a drink. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, Melinda. Um, sorry, I'm just turning my, my camera on here. That was such a wonderful presentation. Um, I really appreciate the, I'm so, um, sorry, let me gather my thoughts. I've recently begun um, my own, you know, personal journey of genealogy. And so looking at um, older documents in such, um, you know, fine detail and, and looking at it, someone's handwriting and, and really, you know, connecting a person's work to, um, and life to documentation and you, you really have such an extensive um, amount of uh, I guess first or not first sources um, primary sources excuse me you have you have quite a number of primary sources that's those thank you so much um, we have a comment in the chat from Diane um, thank you for an amazing presentation interesting that Esther Popel Shaw used her maiden and married names in all her writing and activism especially in an age where women were usually misses and their husband's name do we know why she made sure to keep Popel in her name yeah I think that's interesting too I've noticed that she was publishing at times without her married name and I'll be honest, I don't know much about Esther Popel Shaw's husband. That's something I'd like to spend some more time exploring. Um, I, I think that someone, and I don't know if it was someone else at the college or if it was a family member mentioned that he might have died fairly young. I don't know if that's true or if they parted ways in some other sense. Um, I, I think she members of the family told me that the women in that family are very independent. <laughs> so um, that might be, be part of the answer, but I, I really would like to explore more into um, the story of, of William Shaw to know a little bit more about him. So I'm sorry, I don't have a better answer. It makes it a lot easier to find information about her though, because the popal is, is unique. And when you look for information that really helps to bring her story out. Yeah, um, thank you so much for the question, Diane. Um, if anyone has uh, any other questions or comments uh, from Melinda in the chat, um, 
feel free to, to go ahead and put them in there. Um, Melinda, this is uh, really fascinating work. Um, I, I wonder if you feel um, sort of like a detective when you when you try to find these, you know, especially when when you have things like the question of, um, you know, her her missing husband, not her missing husband, but things you would like to to learn more information about. Um, it is, and I think, um, you know, part of being an archivist is being naturally curious and um, finding it rewarding, I guess, to find little clues and pieces of information, follow up on them and see what kind of a story you can knit together from what might seem like lots of little random bits and pieces, but over time can start to really build a fuller understanding of, of, of what someone's experiences might have been like. Um, so it is, it is part of what I do all day, I guess, <laughs> is um, curiously looking through documents to see what I can learn. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, we have another question from Rebecca is wondering what was Esther Popol Shaw's grade point average, if you know that by any chance? Um, so the college has used a variety of different marking systems, not always the standard, like, zero to 100 scale we have today. So I really can't give a grade point average. And also um, that kind of information, even if it was clear, is protected um, sure. but for privacy. So I can't give you a grade point average, but I can tell you that you have to have pretty superior academic achievement to be selected into Phi Beta Kappa. So she would have been the cream of the crop. And we, um, a little bit more recently discovered um, there was a letter that was written by an another student at the time, a white student who was enrolled at Dickinson at the same time of Esther Popel Shaw and William Jefferson. And he recounted a story about how there was, um, the students were all given a military intelligence test. I guess it was World War I era, so they were probably looking to recruit officers, probably something comparable to today's ASVAB that they give out to students. Um, and this student was involved in helping to mark the grades, which is something, of course, we wouldn't have one student mark other students' grades today. But when the student saw who the top two scorers were, he was not surprised to see that they were the two African-American students at Dickinson. And he doesn't actually come out and name them, I guess, to be discreet, but because we know that there were only, you know, only Esther Popel was here and William Jefferson, we know who the two highest scorers were. So they were definitely excelling among their peers. That's really interesting. Thank you very much. Um, we have another question. Um, how did Esther make her way to Harlem and how long did she live there? So I'm not sure that she, I do believe she attended Columbia University for a while. So she went to graduate school and I would imagine that was her connection to Harlem. And I don't know that she lived there very long. That's something else, again, that I'd like to, to delve into um, because there are those pictures of her at the birthday party with Langston Hughes, but then Langston Hughes remembers seeing her in Washington, D.C., which is where she lived most of her adult life. So um, I don't know if they met in Harlem or in Washington, D.C., um, but I imagine that it was either a connection through Columbia University and being in that area or because she was attending these salons with all of these other African-American authors in DC that she met the other Harlem Renaissance era writers at the time and connected with them that way. Great, thank you so much. Um, not seeing any other questions. I guess my question for you, Melinda, why, why don't we know more about Esther Shaw, especially if she has um, sort of these connections to uh, higher profile names uh, at the time, like Langston, what, what was her work just not popular or what, what would you? No, you know, I'm, I'm curious to know what the thought was at the time. I mean, Langston Hughes mentioned her in, in his autobiography. Sure. Um, and we actually do have, I, I'm sorry, I didn't grab it. We have an anthology um, 
of African American authors that was distributed to high schools and colleges in the 1930s and 40s. And Esther Popel Shaw's poems are included in there, uh, along with people like Langston Hughes, County Cullen. So at one point in time, she was recognized um, as a significant figure. She's showing up her obituaries in the Washington Post. <laughs> that doesn't happen to just anybody. So um, I don't know if it is, you know, the distance of time, um, if it might be because, um, you know, she died relatively young and lost the connection with the college personally at that point and her family kind of relocated to Norway. Um, so there might be lots of, of reasons why. Um, I, I don't think there's any shortage of information out there if we start to know where to, to look. Um, I imagine there's a lot of information at Howard University and in the papers of the other um, important figures and organizations she was involved with during her lifetime. Um, I, I wish I could explore that. I, I don't have the purview to kind of leave the Dickinson College archives and travel around to other places and to do research, but I would love to do that someday if I could. Yeah, it really strikes me just how very involved she was. It seems like she was a member of a number of different, you know, community organizations and doing a lot of, of work, not only um, in a literary sphere, but in a, in a socio-political sphere as well, right? Like she was very involved. Um, and it's, I don't know, it's, a, it's she's a really inspiring figure, I think. And yeah. I think she's <laughs> really, really neat, um, for lack of a better word. Uh, I've got another question. Um, is it possible that Esther's name might be attached to a feature of the Dickinson College um, in commemoration of her achievements? I believe you may have said there's been something. Um, yes, our Center for Race and the Esther Popel Shaw for Race and Ethnicity, which is the office that oversees um, support and programming for students of color at the campus, is named in her honor. Okay, thank you very much. Um, do we have any other questions in the chat? Melinda, I wonder, do you, if you have a favorite um, poem or piece of, of prose from <laughs> Professor from Pobleshaw? Um, well, her poem, A Forest Pool, really moved me. Um, in fact, the first time I read it, I thought that maybe I had read it before somewhere. Um, her poem, uh, Flag Salute, I think, um, you know, as, as, harshly realistic as it is, is very, very moving and just brilliant, I think. So um, that poem would probably be the piece of published writing um, that, that I would choose. But also, to be honest, her diary. Of all the items we have here in the, the Dickinson Archives and Special Collections, her diary to me is the most significant item um, because of the way it just really brings her to life her day-to-day -day life, what she was doing and what she was thinking. And um, just her liveliness is just amazing. Yeah, especially that's, you know, for it to end right before she, she goes to college, right? And and just the, the question too of, you know, her, her last entry about school saying, I'm going to Oberlin in the fall. And then yeah. she doesn't go, that, like, that's a, that's, a, that's a mystery, right? That's what happened, what happened in there? Um, that's, yeah, to, to have such a, a personal primary source, you know, a personal item that the person that, that, that Esther wrote in and is, is hers, that's very cool, uh, to say the least. And I really think the diary just ended because she ran out of space. So sure. um, I've talked to the family about whether or not there might be other diaries, but if there are other diaries, I've, they don't seem, they're not aware of them or they don't have them but maybe someday other, other materials will, will come to light. Yeah, very, very cool. Thank you so much um, for your time and for your expertise on this subject. I thought um, how amazing to be able to speak with her daughter, um, Pat, and to, <laughs> to be able to, you know, have these conversations with her family. Um, she, she truly was, uh, no, a, a pivotal figure, I think, in, in Dickinson's history for, for certain, which um, is 
you know, obviously not Dauphin County, um, but our, our, our neighbors and very important as well. So thank you so much. Um, this is this was such an informative presentation. I see that you put your email in the chat. <laughs> I did. So if anybody would like to contact me with any questions or stories you have that you'd like to share, um, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, I'd, I'd love to hear from you. So please feel free to do that. Yeah, wonderful. Um, thank you so very much again, Melinda. I, I really appreciate your time. 